Okay, at this point, I would like to introduce the Dean of the Albert Dorman Honors College, Katia Passerini, who will introduce our next speakers. Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, I'm Katia Passerini. I'm the Dean of the Albert Dorman Honors College. It's always a pleasure to be here because I see a lot of our students, both girls and boys. Congratulations for being here. Um, at the Honors College, for those of you that are not from NJIT, we're really proud to be helping um, the cause that Nancy really furthers every year, helping women design the future. If you take the Honors College, uh, while NJIT is at about 22 to 25% uh, women, Honors College is almost 40% women um, representing the, the top 10% of the university. So those are real women designing the future. We help attract them and retain them. But I also, I always end up speaking after Nancy has thanked everyone. And I also wanted to say that really the woman designing the future at NJIT again is Nancy Stefan Fleur. So I would like to thank her for everything that she does. Now I'm gonna do my real job, uh, which is the one of introducing two great speakers that you're going to listen to, um, and then followed by the panel. So the first one is Jamie Pallot, co-founder of Embl Emblematic Group. Um, he's a pioneering virtual reality, Emblematic Group is a pioneering virtual reality company whose work has been showcased at the Tribeca Film Festival by the New York Times, um, as part of the to, uh, 2016 Sundance uh, Opdoc program at TED Women and at international venues including Davos, L London Viennese Museum and the Mos Moscow Museum of Modern Art. He was formerly, uh, formerly executive director of Condi Nast Digital where he won a national magazine award for general excellence overseeing websites including style.com, apicurious.com and concierge.com and launching the company first iPhone and iPad applications. Pallet has led major digital initiatives at Time Inc., Microsoft and News Corporation, as well as editing the Virgin Film Guide in the UK. UK. Is a contributing editor of Vanity Fair and has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times Magazine, and Harper's Bazaars. <laughs> Together with Jamie, Behind every great man, there is a great woman, how do you say? <laughs> in front, in front. Uh, Julie Young will also be co-presenting. Producer at the Emblematic Group, you know everything about the Emblematic Group. She, um, she has worked on several room scales VR experiences, including Project Syria, Kia, Across the Line, uh, all at Sundance, Sundance 2015 and 16, and Formula One at the Singapore Grand Prix 2015. Prior to working at the Emblematic Group, Julie was an associate pro producer on the 2012 frontline documentary Fast Times at West Philly High. She's also worked at Goldman Sachs uh, and the, the Motley Fool. She, Julie is, a, gra gra Julie is a, gra a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania where she studied economics at the Water School. Welcome, Julie. Okay, you know it's April Fool's Day when the uh, Women Designing the Future conference is being keynoted by a 56-year-old white guy <laughs> with an accent to boot. So I'm sorry about that. There's only one reason I'm here, and I want to stress this as much as I can. I'm here on behalf of my amazing partner, Noni de la Pena, who is a true pioneer in this field, a pioneering investigative journalist, and now a pioneer in developing what we call immersive journalism, and also a huge champion of women in technology. Um, and I think you will see that exemplified when my colleague Julie Young takes over in exactly 20 minutes, if I'm right, okay? So, um, Noni can't be here physically with us today, but she is here with us in a way that's kind of illustrative of what I'm going to talk about. I say that confidently, pressing this and hoping it will work, and here we go. Do you hear me now, Noni? Nice to meet you. Molagurst. Welcome to Barcelona, Bienvenido a Barcelona. I don't know, Noni, if I could ask you to raise your arms. I would see what I check out the arms. Ya veo que se checa. Keep them up because now we'll show the robot. 
I ara anirem a veure el robot, que ja veieu. Can you move them a little bit more? A veure si els pot moure una mica més. Up and down. Doncs ja veieu que el robot reacciona perfectament amb la Noni. Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Li farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of a robot. What was that experience like? So for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Um, occasionally, there's some problems with the, the, the eye movement, my head, if I move too fast. But beyond that, very quickly, I'm in there in Barcelona with you. So I'll just start talking about this while it plays. Um, this is a video made in 2009, uh, when Noni was uh, working with a lab in Barcelona called the Events, the Events Lab. And... Um, she was interviewed while in LA via a, a robot that was standing and moving and gesticulating in a lab in Barcelona. So a Spanish journalist basically asked her a bunch of questions and Noni answered, although she was in the lab in LA via this robot that's hanging out and gesticulating as Noni likes to gesticulate um, in, in, the, in the lab in Spain. Um, very early use of this kind of technology and the key words that I wanted to leave you with at the end of this were, because the, the, the interviewer says to Noni, how does it feel to be doing this? And he's like, well, it's a little bit, little, little bit weird at first, but then I get the hang of it, and then before I know it, I feel as though I am there with you. And those are the key words that I really wanted to start this off with, because that's what virtual reality is about. It's about a sense of presence, which is a very overused term. We hear it bandied about all the time, but it's very important. I just wanted to sort of really dig into it a little bit before we get started. Um, virtual reality tricks you into feeling that you're somewhere else, okay? Some combination of, of data input into your eyes and your ears really makes you think you're somewhere else, and when you're able to walk around in that other space, and your body tells you that that, that virtual space corresponds to your actual physical space, it's even more powerful. So this notion of presence is what, is what drives the whole thing, okay? The other key term we talk about is um, empathy, okay? Along with that sense of presence, of really being someplace that you're actually not, comes a very strong emotional response. Uh, we're not making this up. It's studied at the highest level at neuroscience faculties uh, around the world. Something about being in this kind of environment creates a deep emotional response to the people and the characters that you see depicted, right? So presence and empathy. Those two things together add up to the potential for a very powerful new tool for storytelling. And that is what my partner, our founder, Noni, started to figure out a long time ago, 2009, way before anyone else was getting into this, that she could do what, something that she calls immersive journalism, right? Using this kind of crazy sci-fi, video game -y sort of environment to actually tell news and documentary stories. Not to put you in a game, not to make you feel like you're in a helicopter hovering over the Bay of Biscay, but like to actually see a, sometimes a, a quite, you know, hardcore piece of investigative journalism. So she coined the term investigative journalism. Um, if we can get any of these slides to work, I have some great examples like of, I can show you how this works. But the first piece started in 2009, and um, she was working at USC, and there was a big multimedia project going on called Hunger in the Golden State. And it was an investigation into, yeah, poverty and hunger in, in California. And it was what we would call then a classic multimedia presentation. Audio, video, stills, text, all done on the web. Um, and Noni had an intern out gathering audio clips. And this intern went to uh, a food bank in downtown LA, uh, where a line of, you know, people were in line, in line for food handouts. And while the intern was there recording audio, one of the guys in line who was diabetic didn't get to the, to the front of the line in time. His blood sugar dropped too low, and he went into, into, he went, went into a coma and collapsed on the ground. Panic, confusion, ambulance arrived, you know, drama, et cetera, et cetera. So the intern came back to the lab uh, with this foot, audio footage, and it just sparked something in Nonny's head right there. Okay, I could, this is actually an important story to tell, and here's a way that I can, I can bring this story into a whole other realm that will me, really make people sit up and take notice and register what's going on here. 
And so she essentially built a virtual environment. She recreated that scene of the people standing in line um, using, I mean, for, for, on a no budget, she did it on self, she, she self funded it. Um, and animated characters recreated the actual people in line. But of course, the audio was the actual audio that her intern had recorded. So, and her academic colleagues and journalistic colleagues were, to put it mildly, extremely skeptical. I mean, it was basically like, you can't do this, it's wrong, you're crazy, that's never going to work, the, the whole gamut of responses. She persevered because um, that's what Nani does. She perseveres. She's one of the world's great perseverers. Um, and three years later, that piece became a, something, a, a VR piece called Hunger in LA, and it was accepted to the Sundance Film Festival. So this was the great testing ground. Um, the piece went to Sundance, and people stood in line and put on this crazy, bulky headset that Nonny's team had built in the lab and went through this piece. And the, res the response was overwhelming. And we saw it again and again and again. People were deeply emotionally moved. More than that, and this is, I have a fantastic video with a split screen that shows you someone doing this a as the piece is happening. Um, so, sorry. Sometimes words are the best medium, so I'm just gonna wing it orally. Um, people would, you could see that they would step around. I mean, th these characters are very obviously fake animations, right? They look like characters in a fairly primitive video game. But when people are going into the experience, they would be very careful to step around them. They were very concerned about the guy on the floor. Many of them actually knelt down, you know, as if to try and help, to see, to see if he was okay. So you, so, and yeah, these are pretty sophisticated people, right? These are people at the Sundance Film Festival, filmmakers, people who are very, you know, savvy about media. And time and again, they came out really moved, some of them in tears. I have another great video of um, someone coming out, that, someone that you would recognize coming out in tears. Anyway, the point was, the whole concept was, we felt validated. You can use this kind of emergent medium to tell a different kind of story, to actually to, to, to tell sort of a documentary story. Um, so since then, we've gone on to make a succession of pieces that sort of try and build on that legacy. The head of the World Economic Forum came through and saw that piece and commissioned us to make a piece called Project Syria to highlight the, the civil war in, 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 in Syria. And this was back, this again, this was back in 2012. So, um, we took a piece of YouTube, a, YouTube, a very well-known piece of YouTube video footage of a bomb going off in downtown Aleppo, and we kind of triangulated that into our video game platform. We went to Aleppo and took location photographs of, of, of the area, scanned in the faces and bodies of, of some real kids, and then sent a secondary unit to the border um, between Syria and Iraq to shoot uh, footage in a refugee camp. And then we made another one of these experiential walk-around experiences. And it's all, everything I say today is worth 1% of going out there into the corner afterwards and putting, putting on the headset and doing the demo for yourself. It will blow you away. This is the ultimate medium where like, until you've actually done it, you can't really get it or understand it. So I would urge all of you to go and try it once I'm done talking. Um, and not showing slides. So anyway, so Project Syria, so you're, literally you're, you're walking in the street, you see a little girl singing, a bomb goes off, there's chaos, there's confusion, you can, you can move around inside the scene, you see people's reactions and responses, and then you segue into, into a refugee camp and there's kind of an infographic overlay about the numbers of kids who've been affected by the conflict. So it, 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 it ties in to, to, the, to the wider issues. Uh, other pieces that we made include use of force, where, um, Okay, a try again, we, we tend to do some pretty hardcore, intense stuff. This was an incident um, at a US Border Patrol post um, in California where an undocumented immigrant had come across the border and he was um, basically beaten and tasered to death by a bunch of US border guards. Um, there were two witnesses who saw this, a bunch of witnesses saw this happen, two of them recorded it on their cell phones. So Nonny got hold of that footage, and again, you used that existing 2D footage to create um, a, a 3D rendering of that event to be able to replay it and recreate it. She also got one of the witnesses, the, the woman who, who took the most kind of telling, um, and it, again, I, I, can't, I can't 
apparently, unfortunately, I can't show it to you, but it's, um, it's, it's really damning. It's literally, like, up from above, you see 12 guys laying into this poor man lying on the ground in, in, in shackles, unable to defend himself. Um, Noni flew that woman, the witness, up to LA to the lab. We motion scanned her, facial captured her, and turned her into a character within the experience itself. So you, you see her as she was during, you know, as the event went down. So that, that brought a whole other, you know, other dimension to, to the experience. Um, the final piece I will talk about uh, before handing over to Julie is a piece called Kia. This was a piece we made in collaboration with um, Al Jazeera America. They had a fantastic, the late lamented uh, Al Jazeera America, who had a fantastic documentary series called Fault Lines. I don't know if any of you, any of you guys watched those. There was one episode about uh, domestic violence, and what they were trying to do was show the correlation. Okay, an, an average of three women a day are killed by their domestic partner in the United States. And this piece took a look at that and figured out state by state that there was a direct correlation between the, the lax nature of gun laws state by state and the rate of domestic violence homicides in that state. So the state with the highest rate of domestic violence homicides is South Carolina, where the gun laws are the loosest. And in the documentary, for example, they show you two of the reporters go into a gun fair and without even having to show a, a driver's license, arrange to meet the guy out back and buy a gun for cash, no questions asked. Um, there was one incident that sort of featured in that documentary where um, a woman came home from a night shift at Walmart to find her ex-boyfriend in the house with a gun, called her two sisters. The two sisters set off to try and help, and the entire sequence of events, and, and each sister called 911. So the entire sequence of events of what happened was captured on 911 calls. So what Al Jazeera wanted us to do was to take this episode and, and turn it into something that would, again, drive home the message even more forcefully. Um, yeah, at this point, I'm sort of, uh, that's okay. Um, let me, let me, yeah, <laughs> let me keep going and then maybe I'll, I'll jump back and just do a couple of those. Um, yeah, drive home the message more forcefully. So we, went down to South Carolina, interviewed the two remaining sisters, took location photographs of the house where it happened, got those 911 calls to the police, cleaned them up, edited them, and put it together into, ex into an experience that, um, again, literally recreates that event and kind of brings it, brings it to life. And again, it's out here if you want to, um, to go and experience it. So, that all makes sense without slides? All right. <laughs> I'm moonlight as a musician, so I'm used to, you know, having to... All right, so I'm, I'm just, you know, because this one is so telling, I do want to play this. Also, a little pop quiz moment. The guy that you see, and this is, this is actually not even at Sundance, this is in the lab before Nonny took it to Sundance. The guy that you see in there, bending down and looking around so so uh, curiously, is Alejandro Gonzalez Inieri too, who just won the, the Oscar for, um, for The Revenant. So this is a very technically challenging day. Let me see if I can get this to play. There's too many people. There's too many okay. people. Okay. Come on. Oh, somebody must. Okay. okay. He's having a seizure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Need, need help. Yeah, we need uh, ambulance, somebody. Yeah, yeah, please. 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 Yeah, at the right side. What did you say? What happened? Sipet. 
maybe her sugar went down. Sugar went down? Maybe. Oh, six No! No! Okay, Go! Okay, okay. To the end of the line. Come on. Go, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Okay, sorry. Please go to the end of the line. I'm not going to give you food. No, go to the end of the line. I'm not going to give you food. You're holding up the whole thing. No, no, no. They take it all for the line. They take it all for the line. No, no, no. Okay, leave it on. 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 You get the idea. Also, FYI, the guy survived. Um, that's one thing we realized as a, as a mistake, that we, we now factor more context into our pieces. You can't leave this thing under the impression that it ended badly, but he, he, he did recover and, and, and was okay. So um, I'll go on one more pop quiz because I just can't resist myself. So this one I'm going to ask you if you recognize this person. This is someone coming out of the experience at Sundance. No, wrong one. All right. So let's just keep going here because that's what to do. Um, just one quick example. The Syria piece, after we showed it at the World Economic Forum, we had a, were given a chance to put it up at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London for five days, completely unmarketed and unadvertised. It was like, we've got a space here, put it up. And the only people who saw it were people who happened to be going to the museum anyway. We filled up 55 pages of guest book comments of people who came through and were so moved um, and so kind of emotionally charged by this piece and one of my favorite quotes here absolutely fascinating a real feeling as if you were in the middle of something that you normally see on TV news so that's really what we're, what we're what we're trying to achieve I talked about all these projects um, very quickly sum up some of the key issues before I hand over to Julie who's a much better more technically accomplished person than I am so we'll not have the same issues I'm sure where are we now in VR a whole other kind of virtual reality has kind of come to be, which we more usually refer to as 360 video. If any of you have seen what the New York Times is doing, they sent out all those cardboard viewers at the end of last year. That's something captured with an actual, a variation on an actual video camera. So it's quote unquote reality as opposed to the CG kind of video game style environments that we build. Um, that's the, the, so the plus of it is that it, it, again, it's sort of reality. The drawback is that it's, it's, it's essentially a sphere, right? So with those things, yes, you can look behind you and around you and up and down, but you're tethered at a central point. If I try and get closer to someone, they recede as I move. So you can't actually investigate or explore or navigate. So it's immersive, but not so immersive. Um, e the evolution of hardware has been astonishing. You saw that crazy headwear that Alejandro was wearing, which was home, homemade in our lab. Uh, this year sees the release, actually Monday was the first one already came out, of the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, and the Sony PlayStation, all of which are these incredibly sleek, consumer-facing, modern, um, much more powerful headsets. So we're, we're there now. This is the year where walk-around, volumetric virtual reality is a reality in your home. Um, we're going to talk later about the ethics of recreations and simulations. We do a lot of journalism. We're in partnership right now with Frontline to make three VR documentaries. And one of the areas we're exploring is what's, what's kosher and what's not kosher in terms of recreating events that happened, right? How much is built on actual, hard, objective, incontrovertible material? And is there any wiggle room for you know, inserting stuff that we don't know for sure in order to create a better experience? That, that's obviously a big issue that we discuss a lot. And lastly, and Julie's going to really address this, the, the emotional impact of having what, what are obviously unreal characters, right? So again, if you see Kia out here, it's a very intense story. It actually happened. You're hearing the, the actual audio of what happened, but the, the physical representations of the people are fairly primitive. It's, 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 you're very aware all the time that they're sort of computer animated renditions of people. Um, and there are pros and cons about you know, whether that actually, actually makes it more effective because it's a little enough distance to make you be able to absorb it better, or whether it's not really going to be effective until we can have people that look totally real. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand you over. Yeah, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to hand you over. Thank you very much. OK, hello, everyone. I'm wondering if my slides are here. Aha, okay.
Um, okay, are we good? Okay, um, so yeah, I'm Julie. Um, I'm a producer at Emblematic Group. Um, uh, I've been there for almost two years now, um, and I was there as employee number one, and now we have 12 full-time employees. So it's been an, a crazy, awesome journey, and um, I've gotten to see a lot of how we've grown as a company and how the pieces have changed and how the technology has changed with it. Um, so um, that's my email there, julieemblematicgroup.com, and my Twitter handle is julieY4 if you want to tweet any questions my way. Um, um, as Jamie said, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, Kia in particular. Um, this is a piece we did last year with um, Al Jazeera America. And they, um, you know, they came to us and they basically said, you know, we want to make VR. We don't really know what we want to make, but here's all of our archives and a bunch of source, a bunch of source material and we should make something. So we went through and we found this story um, of a woman named Kia um, who was shot and killed by her, by her partner in South Carolina. And um, there, there, as Jamie had said, there was like a Fault Lines episode about it, and we had all we had a, a bunch of very, very rich source material. So we had all the crime scene photos um, from when she, when she was shot and killed. We had um, all of the 911 audio. Um, essentially, her two sisters, Kia's two sisters, were making phone calls back and forth with the police, um, and they were trying to sort of instigate an intervention from the police before, you know, trying to keep her alive. Um, because Kia and her, her, her partner were essentially, they were fighting inside the house and her two sisters were outside. So we had all of the real audio from those 911 phone calls. Um, and Jamie also sh shed um, some light on this already, but um, there's, you know, VR has the power to sort of in induce empathy and, and understanding and put people in situations that they could never experience in any other medium. Um, so, um, there, are, there are a lot of like complicated sort of nuanced issues with this particular story. Um, um, so I just, I, I just copied some tweets here from Fault Lines and from the main producer on AJAMS and Cassandra Herman. Um, one, handguns are the most common weapon used in domestic homicide, and around 75% of women killed by their abusers are murdered when they attempt to leave or have just left the relationship. Um, so South Carolina is one of the states, as Jamie was saying, it, it's one of the states with one of the you know, most lax gun laws in the country, and it also is one of the states with the highest rate of, you know, death from domestic violence. Um, so this was an issue that was, that, that this, the story of Kia's death really, it, it brought it to life. And so we wanted to, um, we wanted to, we wanted to tell that story and use VR to, to increase empathy around it. Um, so now I'll kind of go through, um, the actual production process and how you make um, a VR piece that's rendered in real time and uses, um, you know, gaming technologies like a gaming engine and 3D modeling. Um, so the first thing we did was we we created the environment. So there are two main environments within Kia. Um, on the left, my yeah, on the left hand side is the actual crime scene photographs, um, and on the right is our CG recreation of them. Um, so we we took all the photos and we 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 made, you know, in Maya 3D models. And as you can see, it's very, very, very important for us as journalists and as content creators um, to have the most journalistic, the most journalistic accuracy that we can. Um, so, you know, we, every little detail we want to match exactly the same. Um, you know, for example, with the, um, the refrigerator here, which you can see very closely in the experience, we actually took the, the texture directly from the refrigerator itself and, and pasted it onto the, the CG model of the refrigerator. So it's exactly one for one um, the same. Um, okay, so after we um, sort of, we take the audio, we cut it down, we edit it, we make it clearer. Um, then we, we literally cast actors, have them rehearse a script, and we, we get motion capture. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen like the suits with the lights on them. That's like what motion capture is. Um, so we took the actors, we, um, you know, each of them sort of played a different person in, within Kia's story. Um, and we, we, we gave them these suits with these, these markers on them. And we put them in a huge rig with cameras that read the markers. And then they literally act out the scene as if it were a play. And um, the cameras capture the movement, you can see on the right here, they capture the movement of those dots. And then we can actually retarget that to a virtual human 
and animate it. So you, you can animate something by hand, just kind of script it, script a, a human, for example, to walk. Um, but it's much more it's much more realistic if you if you actually capture it from a, a real human and then put it onto an animation. Um, the same thing goes for for facial capture. So we want these humans to have you know the most realistic facial movements that we can. So this here, this is called a head-mounted camera, and all the actors wear this as they're as they're doing the body capture, and um, the, there's a camera in front that actually reads the movement of the dots on your face. Um, so we take the movement of those dots and we put that onto a virtual human. Um, so it just creates them. It's, it's the best way to get the most sort of accurate um, human movement. And um, this here just kind of illustrates the process of, of motion capture. So you have you have somebody wearing a suit, and then you retarget the, the movement of the trackers, and then you put that onto an actual virtual human. Um, so after, after we capture those movements, we, we put them onto the virtual characters who, um, you know, we sort of, we, we use art and, and um, you know, 3D assets to make them look as, you know, as representative of the real characters as we can. Um, so you're probably wondering why we do, why we've used these sort of game-like characters, things that don't look totally photoreal yet. Um, I, I don't know if any of you guys have tried VR before, but a lot of VR is made using 360 video. Um, so what that means is that you literally take um, GoPros in a circle, um, you turn them on, and you walk away, and you come back, and you stitch it together. Um, and then you can show it, you can show one image in each eye, and it creates sort of like a stereoscopic effect. Um, so the, the, the reason we don't do that and we do CG is because we want to be able to actually walk around and experience. So with 360 video, your, your, your head is stuck where the camera is. You can look around like this, but you can't get up and walk around. You can't interact with anything. It's just sort of your inside spherical video. Um, but we, um, this is kind of the big, um, the big point that I want to make with that is that we released Kia twice. Um, we released it first at TED Women last year, um, and we released it on the Gear VR headset, which I don't know um, if you guys, if we, we have some out there, but it's the white Samsung headset that's powered by a phone. Um, that, it, it, that headset only allows for pre-rendered experiences, meaning you basically drop a camera inside a CG environment and record it as if it was spherical video. Um, so you're stuck where you are, you can't move around, you're just stuck watching and looking around. It's very powerful. Um, but we released the project again this year at Sundance on Vive, and there was a night and day difference in terms of how much it impacted people. Like we had people full on crying at Sundance, and it was just, it's 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 so much more powerful because it gives people a sense of agency when you feel like you're actually in the room with somebody. Like if you're in the room with somebody in a gun, and you you can move around and you can get closer to them, you feel like you should be able to intervene, but you can't. And that, that helplessness translates into empathy in a really powerful way. Um, so that's my very long-winded explanation of why we do um, CG characters. Um, and again, all the, the sort of major headsets that are coming out next year, um, the HTC headset, the Sony and the Oculus Rift, um, they all sort of allow for um, real-time rendered content, meaning you can move around, you can interact, um, that sort of thing. So that's what we love to do. Is they're called room-scale VR experiences. Um, and so I was reading um, yesterday. Oculus released a um, uh, an article about their headset, the first consumer version, uh, shipped last week. So it's sort of a big week for VR. There's being a lot of articles written about it, and um, I really like this quote from an article that their chief scientist Michael Abrash wrote. Um, he was he involved he pioneered a lot of the R and D efforts on their part, and they're one of the most sort of um, consumer friendly headsets in my opinion. Um, and I'll just read it directly from the screen. Other people are what we are most highly tuned to because they are what we care about most. And for that same reason, representing them believably is one of the greatest challenges. In the long run, once virtual humans are as individually quirky and as recognizable as real humans, VR will be the most social experience ever, allowing people anywhere on the planet to share virtually any imaginable experience. Um, and I, I really like this quote because it's so, so important to us and to what we do. You know, you can't have, it's hard to do journalism without representing people. <laughs> 
And so making these, we, we, we spend a lot of time and money and energy and developer efforts on creating these, on using mocap and facial cap and all of these things and trying to make very photo real looking humans. Um, but fortunately for us, um, a lot of these technologies that can help us make more photo real humans aren't that far away. Um, the first one is photogrammetry. Um, it, photogrammetry essentially involves putting a person into a rig with 80 cameras, and then each camera takes a photo at exactly the same time. You run that through an algorithm, and it spits out a, C, a very photoreal CG asset. Um, so whereas normally you'd have to actually model a human from scratch, you can take a real human and make a CG model, and then go back and do the mocap and the facial cap and animate them as you would any traditional character. Um, so on the left is um, our actress and one of my, my really good friends, actually. Um, her name is Lee. Uh, she was one of the um, actresses in um, our Planned Parenthood piece. Um, and as you can see, this is a much more photoreal way to depict a character. Um, and on the right is a picture of, it's actually my 3D scan. Um, I was wearing a wig. As you can see, um, hair, anything that sort of is supposed to flow naturally, like hair or dresses or skirts or anything like that, does not work very well in computer-generated humans at all. Um, but uh, we're getting there. So this is something we're really excited about because it can actually take textures from a real face and put them onto a virtual human. Um, something we're super, super excited about because it solves a whole slew of problems from the, on the production process is videogrammetry. Um, videogrammetry is essentially the same thing as photogrammetry except that you have, uh, it, you're, you're taking actual video at sort of localized um, points. So, um, so uh, this is from um, a company called ADI, which is uh, also based in Los Angeles, and they're sort of pioneering the videogrammetry efforts. Um, you, you put someone into a rig, as you would in photogrammetry, and you record them. And then instead of having to actually animate, as you would in photogrammetry, you just drop the hologram that's already moving and acting and doing everything you want it to do. You drop that into a virtual environment. Um, so that solves all of our problems, and it's probably the single thing that we're most excited about this year because it's really starting to pick up. Um, you know, if videogrammetry had been around when we did Kia, we would have hired actors, hired a costume designer, um, had them rehearse their lines perfectly, and then we would have put them inside a videogrammetry rig, had them run through the experience as if it were a play, and then we would have just dropped those holograms into an environment, and it creates a much more photoreal, much more immersive experience. Um, so that is definitely something we're super, super excited about. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about, about Kia um, and the production process on that end. Um, but since we are at a, um, an event focused on women, um, I wanted to talk about women in VR and AR and MR. Because um, we're at a point right now where this industry is, is literally being born. You know, Oculus was released this week. Um, HTC Vive is being released in a couple weeks. And then, um, you know, Sony is probably going to be released this summer. And um, the industry is still very malleable. We still have a chance to make sure that we have um, diverse opinions and diverse representation across the industry. With every emerging technology before it, we failed to do that. And so I really don't want that to happen for <laughs> VR, AR, and MR. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of sort of women in VR um, initiatives. I run the, the LA group, and then I've sort of teamed up with San Francisco group, a New York group, um, and a DC group. And um, we have a Facebook group. Um, it's facebook.com slash groups slash women in VR. Everyone should go join it. It's the best Facebook group ever, not that I'm biased. Um, uh, we have women in there. It's 80% it's women, 20% men. Um, but we have women in there who work at like Unity, Oculus, Sony, Vive, like any kind of Intel, any kind of um, like sort of mixed reality technology you can think of is represented in that group. And it really has a lot of, um, I think, uh, positive discussion. Um, so if you email me at julia emblematicgroup.com, I can add you to that group. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, the Shift Foundation. Um, so, you know, um, me and a couple of these other these other women that we that have been working together over the last couple of, uh, maybe the last year and a half or so to run these meetups and make sure women are involved in VR. Um, we wanted to take this community that we had built and actually turn it into actionable steps. You know, we wanted to say what can we actually do rather than just having people meet people. <laughs> um, so 
uh, we started the Shift Foundation, um, and uh, we, we just got 501c3 status a couple of weeks ago, so we're super excited about that. Um, and we're partnering with hardware companies, software companies, and content creation companies to um, you know, essentially run grants and scholarships for women and minorities um, you know, in VR, and VR, AR, and MR. Um, so this is really important to us because we want to just make sure that like, diversity starts at the beginning, and if we don't have it this year, we're probably not going to have it. So um, it's really important um, that, that these issues are brought to light. Um, so yeah, definitely follow us. Uh, our Twitter, these are, this is our Twitter handle, shift.org. You can also just email me at julia.emblematicgroup.com. Um, we're going to be running the first sort of set of scholarships and grants this summer. Um, so if you're, um, uh, you know, if you're a student, an animation student, um, CS, gaming, um, DMD, anything like that, um, definitely come my way. Um, okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're into panel time. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Miriam Ascarelli. I teach here at NJIT in the Humanities Department. Um, and we have a lovely panel here of um, Jean Gray, um, who is, uh, let me pull up. She's the publisher of the, uh, mag the publication American Entrepreneurship Today. It covers entrepreneurship at both the national and the state level, and she also consults to startup and early stage tech companies. Previously, she built two companies in two different industries, and the first was a display and design company in the cosmetic industry serving clients such as Chanel and Elizabeth Arden, and then she built a comp local computer networking company into a nationwide technical service company serving clients such as Barnes & Noble, Coinstar, and American Express. She graduated from Cornell University and received her MBA from NYU's Stern School of Business. Over here, we have uh, Lauren Udgorgi, uh, from uh, She's the Associate Vi uh, Vice President for Communications, Branding, uh, Communications Marketing and Branding here at NJIT. Previously, she served for 14 years in a similar role at uh, Princeton. And she also served as a sec Assistant Secretary of State for the state of New Jersey and started her career as a journalist. She covered education at the Boston Globe, City Hall of the Dallas Times Herald, and general news for the Newark Star-Ledger. She holds a Master of Science degree from Columbia University School of Journalism and a bachelor's degree in English from Princeton. So um, what we thought we would do is keep things fairly informal. And um, we'll start off um, with some questions, but then we'll turn it over to you guys, the audience. Um, and I thought I'd, um, I'd, I'd start things off by just talking about storytelling. We, um, one of the, 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 the themes that has come up repeatedly in conversations we've had, both on the phone before this event and even today out in the hallway um, in front of the demos, was, you know, um, uh, what makes, what's a good, uh, what kind of stories are best told using virtual reality? As a former journalist myself, one of the things that strikes me is that all, you know, all the work that um, the folks from the emblematic group are doing requires on, at some level, on the most basic level, good old fashioned shoe leather journalism, okay? It didn't just sort of come together because of the tech, it came together because of that sort of basic foundation of reporting. And I was hoping that um, either Jamie or Julie could take up that question, you know, what's, what, you know, how do you choose your stories and which stories are best told using virtual reality? Um, you're jinxed. Oh, my goodness. Here. Here. Okay, so my very straightforward answer to that is that there are, what are the two things that VR does best? One is it creates this sense of empathy and presence, right? So it's got this powerful emotional charge. And two is that it, um, it picks up your voice and amplifies it in a way that it can be heard. No, no, it doesn't, okay. So two is that um, we call it spatial narrative, right? Especially, that's why we focus on this, the walk around stuff because 
Think of all those stories where the physical dimensions of what happened are key to understanding how it went down. An example I always go back, this would be my dream story, would have been my dream story to have done was like mm, four or five years ago now. I don't know how many of you will remember, but there, there was a New York Times correspondent called David Rohde who was uh, captured in Afghanistan and was held prisoner for like, I think it was like 18 months in this compound, and he eventually escaped. And it was one of the greatest pieces of not just newspaper media, any media that I read all year, and I remember talk, talking about it with my, my boss at the time, Graydon Carter at Vanity Fair, he agreed with me, the Times serialized the story of his escape, of how he plotted to get out, and da da da, da. And it was very physical, right? And, on the, on the, and, and they serialized it, serialized it over five days, around an entire week of the newspaper. And on the last day, they had this fantastic infographic, and it was like a 3D model of the compound, and it showed exactly how far he had to walk under cover of darkness and where the rope ladder was hidden for him to get up. And, and it, it just, you know, as, as great as the storytelling had been day by day, this little diagram actually put it in a whole different level and really made you understand what happened. So that's the kind of story also that VR can tell like nothing else, right? To be able to be in the space and go, oh, he was over there with the gun and she was here with the knife. So there's no way that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we... we Whenever we think about a story, we ask, we ask ourselves, the, f the first question we ask ourselves is, could this story be told just as well or better in 2D, right? And if so, we're not doing it. What is there specifically about this that lends itself to being done in this medium? Um, and, I'm, and, I suppose, and I suppose, sorry, I'm going on and on and on, but um, the, so going, back to, going back to use of force, right, the piece which I didn't get to show you about the, 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 border, the, the border guards beating up the, the undocumented immigrant, um, that story had been told. Right? A really good investigative journalist called John Carlos Frey had done the, done the digging, done the legwork, interviewed the witnesses. The story had, had broken like at local press and it just wasn't getting picked up. So our thought was we take that, we, we piggyback on his work and put it into the experience which, which impacts you so massively when you, go, when you go through it, we're just kind of shining a more powerful emotional light on a story that's already been told. I guess that's fair. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. <laughs> well, Jamie, I don't, I don't know if you should yeah. sit down just okay. yet. Um, is this working? Can Let's you all hear me? Set. Does mine work? Okay. Yeah, I'm on there. Now you can't hear me. <laughs> okay, now you can hear me. So, Jamie, just as important as... Uh, the stories you tell, I believe, is who is telling the story. And I think that all of our students are very interested in careers. Um, they're also interested in social justice. Um, so can we talk, obviously you're taking a bit of a documentary approach um, to VR. What other uses are there for VR? Obviously there's gaming, unfortunately there's the porn industry. But in terms of social justice, what else is being done? No? Oh, uh, just in terms it. of social, social justice? Do um, <laughs> I don't know that there are many other people doing stuff that is themed around social justice. As Julie said, we are in the, the, the industry is in its infancy. Um, there are people making games. There are, I mean, I've seen, I've seen a couple of other pieces that I would say have um, some kind of social impact. Um, there was a piece at Sundance about... Um, uh, when the Australian government did nuclear tests out in the outback and the um, indigenous people thought that the gods had arrived and, sort of, and worshipped the lights in the sky and then 10 years later they're all, they're all dying off. So um, I, don't, I don't know of any other group that is as focused on it as we are. I'll put it that way. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, on the other hand, lots of people are using this for what I would say are kind of clinical or therapeutic purposes. So um, there's a guy in London called Mel, Sl Mel Slater who just made the, and, he, and not only has worked with him, but kind of was inspired by him. So what, he, what he's just done is trying to help um, patients with chronic depression. He created a VR experience whereby a depressed person goes into the scenario and he or she sees an avatar of him or herself that reflects their body movement. So it's, you know, it's them basically. And then at some point, um, a small crying child is introduced into the scenario. And then at another point, the 
this character morphs into that one. And then you as the adult are encouraged to soothe the child and to remind the child of all the good things that's happened to it in its life and to um, and all, all the people that, that love it. Da, da, da. Um, so basically you're, you're put into the, into, into the position of soothing and calming and encouraging yourself, your own inner child. Um, and it's been clinically and medically proven to have a more, to be more effective as a means of um, aiding people with chronic depression than any known drug or kind of traditional therapy. Um, there are other examples. Uh, okay, the, <laughs> but there, was, there was a company called DeepStream that got, got some, some of the same seed money that we did from a, a VR incubator, and they work with people with, uh, with burn victims. So, and again, and you know, it, it, I say this stuff and I'm like, you know, it can't be true. It is true. I've seen it. People with suffering from third degree burns, right? They, they put them in the headset and it's a simulated snowscape. So I think they're in a, a beautiful white snowy landscape and someone is throwing snowballs at them and they have to dodge to get out of the way of snowballs. And again, you know, neurological readings in the brain show that it's more effective at taking these patients' mind off the pain than morphine, okay? It's incredibly powerful stuff. And, and there's, no, there's no end to the, to the ways it's, it's, in which it's going to be applied. You know, in a less, not so much on social good, but in business to business. I mean, Boeing, right? You're an engineer designing a piece of a turbojet engine in Newark, New Jersey, and you're working with someone in Melbourne, Australia, who's going to be designing a piece that goes next to it. You can literally, hi, how are you doing? Like, right? So, um, yeah, the, uh, the uses are pretty much endless, I would say. Endless. Endless. <laughs> Huge. Um, so uh, I guess I'm going to assume my mic's on, right? Okay. So um, first of all, I'd like to say that anyone here can go out and experience what I did. Please, yeah. Don't miss this opportunity. Um, I'm not a jump in the water person, even though I'm an entrepreneur and I just went out there and that is eye opening what that technology is. So, so don't leave without trying to get online. And, and see what they've brought to us uh, today. So in view of that, um, I was hearing you know, Sundance uh, Festival and, uh, and Oculus and what you have out there and, and, and keeping it to journalism. So where is the target audience in the masses? Are we gonna be in front of TV sets with headsets? Where, where is it happening now and the limitations? And where is it going to be in 10 or 15 years where this is really out there? Yeah, I think it's, is this fun? Okay. Um, I think um, that, you know, the, the, um, the New York Times once predicted that television was going to fail because people wouldn't have enough, enough time to look at screens all day. And which is super ironic because now all we do is look at screens all day, <laughs> and <laughs> like, we carry televisions in our pockets. And um, I think that that it's going to be hard to predict how VR is going to evolve and how it's going to work. I think a lot of people think it's going to eventually become um, glasses or a contact lens or something like that. Um, but I think it's hard to tell. Um, the the most the, the thing I'm most sure about is that people always gravitate towards um, the most immersive way to communicate something, especially when you're trying to share a social experience. Um, there's, you know, once FaceTime came out, I, I, you know, I rarely pick up the phone to call my mom anymore. I just FaceTime her. And so I think that VR is, is on the same trajectory. Um, so I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how mass adoption is going to come. I think we're still many, not many, probably five or six years away from that, um, where journalism is going to really kind of People are going to are going to consume journalism in that way. Um, it's going to be more mostly gaming for the next probably two years. Um, so yeah, I don't think people know, but but I'm sure of it. So so, <laughs> so in the next six months to twelve months, where would someone in this audience be bumping up against your product in the, in the movie theater, or do they have to go to a special festival, just so that we see the immediacy. Oh, okay, in the we'll, next six months. Right, so okay, we'll yeah. take it to this way. So, so someone here leaves today and you're gone, but all of a sudden they're somewhere in New York City or LA yeah. and they see something happening. What is that? They're, where Where is this being deployed so they can see? Well, if you want, if, 
um, if you have like the, the Google Cardboard, you can see many of our experiences. But for the next year, it's still going to be restricted to people that actually have the high-end headsets. Um, so the real, the real barrier to entry with the headsets is not necessarily the cost of the headset itself. It's the cost of the computer and with the GPU to run it and all those things. Um, and right now, that's sort of just, that's only in gamer territory at this point. Um, but if, you know, each hardware that's coming out, Sony, Oculus, and, and Vive, they all have their own distribution platform. You know, they all have their own iTunes equivalent. Um, and we're accessible via all of those. Yeah. We have some logistical questions. Can we, can we continue um, with the panel, or do you want us to turn it over to the, the audience? Okay, audience, uh, we'll pass the mic to you. It's, it's on, yeah, come on, come on. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, just along the lines of um, the social justice issue, and um, there were some questions that came up from the morning's panel about ethics and veracity. And one of you mentioned the Planned Parenthood story, which just triggered in my mind that a story always gets changed every time it's told. So a documentary of the real thing is not going to be the same as a documentary in VR, um, from my initial thinking of seeing this today. And what is going to protect journalism so that we don't have more of the Planned Parenthood stories coming out piecemealing together pieces of facts that in totality were not facts. So that it doesn't become yet another tool that leads us down the path of um, untruths being put out there as facts and people then interpreting them government being run by it, legislation being passed on it, and all of that. You really freaked me out for a second. <laughs> because when you talked about the Planned Parenthood videos, I thought, I thought you were talking about our piece that we yeah. made for Planned Parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, right, right, yeah, right, 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 right. I mean, uh, I'll, we, we see ourselves as journalists first and foremost, right? We're very well aware that we have this powerful tool, tool in our hands that can easily be used for the wrong purposes, right? I mean, propaganda is gonna to start to happen, as, as it does in, in, all, in all forms of media, but this one is kind of, kind of especially kind of dangerous and, and powerful. So what we see ourselves doing, and actually we, you know, we, we just signed a deal with Frontline to make a series of, doc, of documentary, documentaries with them, but also to try and articulate and distribute best practices for journalism in VR because we don't really know. We're making this, we're figuring this stuff out as we go along. And as Julie was talking about, you know, technological advances come along to let you start to do something different and make something look more realistic. And that you have to factor that into the form because you want people to respond and to like it. But it, is that then gonna change the way something looks that's not, that's less like what it actually looked like? So all we can do is to try and, we follow our instincts. You know, so in, in, the, in the Kia piece, for example, um, we, we tried to stick to incontrovertible material. So the audio was the audio. That was actually said, right? That, that's kind of transparent. Um, the location photograph, that's the house. That's what it actually looked like. We, Nani interviewed the two sisters, right, to get them to show her exactly who was where and how they moved. You know, do we know 1,000% that every step was accurately the person that, no, of course we don't, right? Um, but close enough that the New York Times was said, okay, well, this is good enough for us, we're gonna put our, our, our imprimatur on this. So, you know, that's like a very roundabout way of saying we don't really know, but we're trying to figure out figure it out as we go along. But I, I do wanna say something about the Planned Parenthood piece because it, it's, it's funny that it kicked off that reaction in me. We made a piece for Planned Parenthood, but we're very aware of the distinction between a piece of journalism where we just want to hew as closely as we can to the facts, and an advocacy piece. Because what we did for Planned Parenthood was quite different. Uh, are we showing it today? Do we no. Have, we don't have it out there. So, um, it's actually a hybrid. So part of 360 video, right, of 
actual people and there's an actual doctor that works in the, in the clinic and, and um, an actual patient arriving outside. And then what we wanted to do was to recreate that sense of having to run the gauntlet and fight your way through a, a crowd of hostile people waving placards. You might be going in to get a regular checkup, but it's right. It's it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty terrible experience. Um, I'm. Noni wanted to do something like to see what, what, what would a collage be in VR, right? So we actually collected real audio of people yelling really, really outright, you know, terrible things at women going to clinics all across the country and took snippets from here and there and put them into the mouths of animated characters, right? So I, I, once you come out of the 360, per, 360 piece, which is real, you're then actually walking towards the door of the clinic and you have to run this gauntlet of animated people who were saying stuff at you, which was actually said by an actual person outside an actual clinic, but not all in that same, right? So in that case, that's not strict journalism, but we, we did what we thought would be the most powerful thing we could to convey this experience of women having to run a gauntlet. So um, yeah, go there. if I can just add, I was glad Julie talked about diversity, um, because this is an emerging field. I think the best way to protect the standards and to make sure the right stories are being told is to make sure there is diversity in the field. Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I started as a journalist, we weren't telling a lot of domestic violence stories. We weren't telling a lot of stories that women cared about, that people of color cared about, because there were so few women and people of color who were journalists. Unfortunately, that still remains the case today. So our students need to get involved, whether it's on the tech end or on the journalism and storytelling end, in emerging fields like this. So, so, so Julie, can you, can you share with the audience, for someone who's still in college and they're either aspiring to be a journalist or uh, maybe, maybe you can flip it the other way, is where were you to get to where you are today? Is did, did you want to be a journalist, or did you have a technology interest um, to to get you into this uh, unique spot? Um, yeah, I've always I've always really been interested in in basically two things: finance and storytelling. Um, so I sort of split my time equally between those two things. In college, you know, I went to I went to business school undergrad, and I I uh, worked for a bank, and I worked for um, an asset management firm. Um, um, but then I also kind of spent a lot of time doing theater and film and stuff like that. Um, and I did documentary work. Um, yeah, I think I, when I graduated college, I basically said, um, I want to go into storytelling and I want to, and I want to, but I want to work on like the business side of that. Um, and once I found out about VR and what Nani was doing, um, I was completely blown away. Um, so I, I, I literally moved to LA. <laughs> I moved to LA and like stalked Nani repeatedly and like sent her all these Facebook messages. <laughs> and here I am two years later. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think, um, you know, I just thought what she, she, what she was doing was so cool. And it was clearly the beginning of a new way to tell stories. And um, um, I think when, when, in, when it's a new medium and there's not a lot of people in it, you have the opportunity to really um, make an impact and do a lot of things. And um, that was really appealing to me. Yeah. So, so I, I would just like to build off on that because I'm a serial entrepreneur and a lot of people posed to me how I did my career. Mm -hmm. And there was a question out of the audience earlier. Is So building on what Julie said, is, is forming a vision of where you want to go with such passion drives you to take steps that many other people will, will not take. So I, I just encourage people to understand Julie's way of getting to where she is now is she came up with a vision, literally physically moved, <laughs> stalked her, her future <laughs> employer possibly, um, and that's how it happens. Yeah. It's, it's not sitting at home, it's, it's coming up with a path to that vision that is much grander and bigger than many of what your peers have, and then you end up in a really good spot yeah, uh, well, one, in, in a company like this. Yeah, one thing that, that I realized after I graduated was like, there are so many cool things that you can do, like for your job. Like people can pay you to do these like really cool things, <laughs> and so um, yeah, I think it's it's available. Right. Just, so yeah. I, I know we're we're running short on time, Sorry. so I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Um, and I hope all of you sort of take that 
final note of inspiration and, and you know, sort of the, the empowerment idea with you. Um, and on to the next, uh, next event.